Amen and amen. Well, I just thank God to be before you here again. We done made it through another year. How many of you are glad that God has given you another year of life? All right, all right, all right. Thank God today that he's given us another year. And I want to let you know today, if God has given you another year, that means that you still have purpose left in you. That God still has plans left for you. You could have been taken out in 22. You could have been taken out in 21, but I want you to know today that you're still here. That means God still has a plan for your life. So live accordingly. Set your pace this year knowing that God is getting ready to prosper you and God is getting ready to take you to where he has need of you in 2023. I want you to know today that as we look over this year that we get set to start, um, that there will be indeed some blessings that we receive from the Lord. I want you to know that. That, that God has blessings assigned for his children. But I also want you to understand today that there will be some strife that you'll face this year. That this year will not be perfect. This year will be good because God is good all the time. But I want you to know that there will be some battles that you face this year. And so in order for us to get straight so that we will be prepared for the battles that are coming ahead, we want to learn the basics of how to battle and the things that we'll face this year will be stronger because we know the basics going in. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting with the first verse. And we're going to read through verses 11. 1 Samuel chapter 4. We'll start with verse 1 and read through the 11th verse. Amen. And we want to set the pace for this year. We want to be prepared for the battle that's ahead Moving in victory like we know that our God has already provided for us. All right. And this is what it says. It says, now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. Now, let me set this straight for y'all so that y'all understand what's taking place. The Israelites are God's chosen people. These are God's people that it's talking about that are facing off against the Philistines. And it says initially that the Philistines defeated them and killed 4,000 of their men on the battlefield. Look at verse 3. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemy. So the people went, uh, sent men to Shiloh and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. When the ark of the Lord's covenant into the camp, all of Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated. Every man fled his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. I know this is probably not what you were thinking before it was headed to. You were probably thinking, okay, the Israelites will come out mighty. They got the ark of the covenant, but yet it says 30,000 of them were taken out, and the Lord's ark was captured. Today, there, as we look at this scripture, there are some things that we can take from this that we can apply to us at the beginning of the year so that we can be stronger and that we learn the battlefield basics. Today, I want to talk to you from that subject titled the battlefield 
basics. We don't want to find ourselves excited about this year, excited about things, and not have the understanding of the basics. It's a new year, and, and, and many of us make resolutions that coincide with the beginning of the new year. These New Year's revolu resolutions we make are goals that we have for the year, and we seek and aspire to make those goals come true. I can recall looking at the goals I made down in 2022, and I wrote down these goals, but I realized as I looked at the goals that some of them I did not achieve. I was excited about those goals, but I was more excited about the goal than the process and some of those things. I, in fact, my, my goals were set, and some of them I didn't have a plan in place to achieve. I, I, I set the goal, but did not set a plan in place. Like, I, I said I wanted to get more fit, but, but yet I never bought a gym membership. <laughs> I said I wanted to get in better shape, but I, I wasn't working out consistently. And the problem was, without a proper plan, there was no way that I would be successful in gaining that goal. In fact, a wise person once said that failing to plan is planning to fail. That if I don't have a plan in place, that it's not going to be successful. I can't just go willy-nilly with the wind and, and expect things to fall into place, but I have to follow this plan in order for me to be successful in my goals. And that's an even more important point when we're talking from our spiritual lives. It's very important that we have God intimately involved in the plans that we make. If you want to succeed in 2023, let me start you off by letting you know that your plans need to involve God. If you want to do your things on your own, I guarantee you that even if it is successful for a season, that eventually it will fail if you have not involved God in the plans that you make for this year. Why should we involve God in the plans that we make? Because he tells us to trust in him with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways, we need to acknowledge him. And all means all. That means that everything that we knew is for the year that's coming up and for the furtherance of our lives, we need to make sure that we're involving God in it and trusting in him to lead and guide our paths. Proverbs also goes and tells us that many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. That we can make all the plans that we could ever think of and have all the ambition that we could ever dream of. But it's God's plan and his purpose that is the prevailing thing. That it will always prevail. The Proverbs also go on to tell us to commit to the Lord in whatever we do. That means every aspect of our life we need to commit to the Lord in that. And he will establish your plans. If we just commit to God and we tell God, okay, God, which direction do I need to go? Lord, I'm praying and I'm asking you right now to, to guide my actions, to guide my heart. I'm committing myself to whatever you tell me. Then he will establish your plans for you. That he'll put you in places that man can't tear you out of. That he'll set you up so that nobody can bring you out of what he's put you into. And I'm telling you that today because as we start this year, it's vitally important that we're committing our plans, committing our goals, committing our resolutions to God so that we can be successful on the other side of that. As we look at our scripture today, it's interesting because the Israelites made a plan. At the beginning of the scripture, it talks about them setting up and getting ready to battle against the Philistines. It says the Israelites were camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines were, were camped out at Aphek. And they were ready to go to battle. And, and, and in our scripture, they were confident in the plan because they were God's chosen people. And they battled with the Philistines on many occasions. And so I, I'm sure as they were setting up on battlegrounds, the first thing they were thinking is, oh, okay, we've been here, we've done that, we're going to defeat them. And so as we look and we see what initially takes place, the Philistines follow, uh, come against the Israelites. And the initial battle... The Israelites lose 4,000 men. They thought they were going in there to win. They thought they were going to win the battle. And, and instead, they lost badly. They lost 4,000 people. And it says they got them all running out of the camp. They had them running with their tail tucked between their legs. They set this plan up, yet they failed. So the elders and the senior leaders come together and they start to devise a plan. They say, let's... Take the ark of God and bring it into the battle. 
They say we failed initially. And what we notice is, is that the beginning doesn't say anything about them consulting God even before they went to get the ark. It doesn't say anything about them consulting God before the initial battle where they lost 4,000 people. But because they had gone through some trouble and, and gone through some heartache and loss, they said, okay, well, what, what can we do? Let's, let's bring the Ark uh, of the Covenant out. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Ark of the Covenant, it represented the presence of God. It represented the presence of God. It was stored in the most holy place in the tent of meetings where only the priests saw it at a certain point in time. And the Bible says that God would meet with them at that place. The covenant represented an amazing experience of being close to God. And the ark itself was so beautiful. It was overlaid with gold and it, was, had, it, it had these um, priceless heirlooms inside of it. it. It had the stone tablets that had the Ten Commandments on it. It, it. it had the staff of Aaron. It even had some manna in there. It reminded them of the of God and how God had brought them through so many things. The Ark of the Covenant was truly an incredible thing to behold. And so what they figured was by taking the Ark of the Covenant onto the battlefield with us, surely we'll get the win. By having something that represents God, surely we'll get the W. The army cheered so loud when they brought the Ark of the Covenant out, it says it shook the earth. It was so loud, they were so hyped. <sighs> Here come the ark, we're going to get the dub. Yeah, let's go. They turned up so much when the ark came out that it said it shook the earth. They brought it to the battlefield. But then something happened that even I didn't expect when I was reading this scripture. They brought the ark out. They excited. It shook the earth. The enemy camp, it says they were afraid. The enemy camp was scared when they brought the ark. When they heard them yelling and they heard about the past, the things that God had done before, the enemy saw that and they were afraid. Yet after the ark came out, the Israelites got beat seven times worse than they did before the ark was even there. They lost 4,000 the first time. They lost 30,000 people when the ark came out on them. 30,000. They, they had lost 4,000 before. They had already took a heavy loss. But then they tried to bring a semblance of God out onto the field. And now they lost even worse than they could have imagined. I'm not the best at math, but 4,000 is a lot less than 30,000. And I would think when they brought the Ark of the Covenant out there, because I told you the, the majesty of the Ark of the Covenant, that that would be the victory. But instead, they, they, they lost Seven times worse than they did before they even brought the ark. Reading this, it, it wasn't the outcome I expected to see because I just, I just knew they would win, but they, they lost even worse. But I want to encourage somebody today by letting you know that God is able to help you win the battle. That God is able to carry you through and give you a victory that was unforeseen by your enemies. To give you a victory because he has already won the ultimate victory. But we also have to remember that God is not a God that will be mocked, that, that we can't play with him and expect that he'll do exactly what we want him to do. He wants us, he wants to help us today and, and help us get through this battle by having the correct strategy. And so today what I want to give you is a few basics for the battlefield so that when you do come out, that you can expect the victory because you're doing it the way that God has prescribed. The first of those things that I want to remind you for 2023 as we get ready to move forward is that we do not make God an afterthought. If you want to be prosperous in 2023 and you want to see the great works of God happen in your life, put him first and don't make him an afterthought. Don't, don't make it a, okay, after I try to figure it out on my own, then I'll see what God has for me. In, in the first battle with the Philistines, the Israelites made this crucial mistake. They did not consult God before they went to battle. They tried to step out on their own, and before they saw God in prayer, before they saw God in worship, before they even reached out and tried to do anything to hear from God, they went to battle. They said, let's just do it. Let's go. Let's, let's jump out there. They make that spur-the-moment decision without seeking God, and it cost them 4,000 lives. Because they did not seek God, they took heavy casualties in what should have been a victory 
because they did not first seek after God and his plan for them. Even if the Philistines were the aggressors here, they still should have sought after God on how to handle the battle. Even if it wasn't their fault, they weren't the ones that they wanted to fight at that time. The Philistines were coming after them. But that did not give them an excuse not to seek after God. And I want you to know in your life today that battles may come find you sometimes. Sometimes the enemy may send things your way. Sometimes you may be just doing things the way that you should be and trouble still finds you. But that does not give you an excuse not to first seek God on how to handle that trouble. When heartache comes around the corner and it comes at you tough, I want you to understand that it shouldn't be your knee-jerk reaction to try to come back at the person that broke your heart. That even if the battle comes to you, that you first seek God. God, show me how to handle this. God, show me how to get peace in this situation. God, show me how to address this person that hurt me. God, lead me and guide me in this battle because I know that if I do it, I'm going to take heavy casualties in my life. I know that it's going to be bad news if I try to handle it all on my own. When we get into trouble, it, it, it's easy for us to immediately react out of our flesh, immediately react by the way that we always done things. How often do we find ourselves in a battle and forget to seek after a word from God? I'll be honest, I'm guilty of it sometimes too. It's easy for us to react first and then later be like, ooh, <laughs> I probably should have took a second before I responded. I didn't have to text them back in all caps. <laughs> I, I didn't have to jump down their throat because they said something that I didn't like. If we would take a second and say, God, before I move, let me get you involved. This has obviously stirred my emotions. This has stirred the way I feel. And because it has stirred me, it's vitally important that I seek God before I respond. We can try to figure out every other solution but I promise you that they will all prove futile until we consult God about the matter that we're dealing with. We can try talking to a friend and asking a friend, how would you handle this situation? We can come to our, our ministry leaders and ask them, okay, what, what do you think we should do here? We can, we can ask um, Siri and Siri may give us a response. There's so many people and things that you can ask, but I promise you that the best answer you can get will be a response from God and his word through prayer, through praise and worship. When we consult our own wisdom before we pray about it, we're setting ourselves up for failure. That plan will eventually fail. And we shouldn't be worried about what the outcome of this situation will be. Philippians 4 and 6 tells us, don't be anxious about anything. Even when the circumstances are coming against us, it says, don't be anxious about that. I know that that attack came my way, but I'm not worried about it. I know that people were coming against me, but I'm not worried about it. I know my money looking funny right now, but I'm not worried about it. I know I'm dealing with this health crisis right now, but I'm not worried about it because it tells me in the word, don't be anxious about anything. But it doesn't just tell me don't be anxious and leave me high and dry with my emotions. It says don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and thanksgiving, present your request to the Lord. Go to the Lord with it. Seek him with it. I know the circumstances is hurtful and, and I know it's causing you pain. <coughs> Excuse me. But it says, seek the Lord. Make your request known. We miss the mark when we use prayer as our last resort. We miss the mark when we say prayer is reserved for breaking the glass in case of an emergency. We miss the mark when we don't use prayer as our first and initial decision that God's the way that we work things out. But we, we push it to the back burner. If you make God second in your finances, you will see the struggle that it causes. If you make God second in your marriage, you'll see that it'll only increase your strife. If you make God second in your relationships with your friends, you'll see y'all fighting more than hanging out and having a good time because the problem is God needs to be the center of every relationship. Okay. Seek him first and he'll guide your steps. Seek him first and he'll handle everything else. Seek him first and he'll be able to bring you through whatever circumstance you're dealing with. 
it's clear cut and dry that we don't make God an afterthought if we're a believer in Jesus Christ. That we make sure that whatever battle that may come our way, whatever one we may be facing, that we seek him first. That way, when the battle comes your way, we seek God for his strength and, and for his wisdom. And, and, and he gives us strategy. And, and as we get into his word, he leads and guides our actions. So we got the answers before we even get in the battle. And we seek after him first. If we don't make him an afterthought, if we made him the primary reason that we live our lives, then I guarantee you that the battle will not overtake you. The next thing that we need to understand as a battle feel basic as we get ready to fight in 2023 is that we seek relationship with God, not just the blessings. That we seek to have a relationship with God, not just the benefits of being in the relationship. Many times we, we feel defeated in our battles because things don't work out the way we wanted them to. We feel defeated because things didn't go how I envisioned it in my mind. But if we really examine why things don't work out, at times it may be because they're not aligned with the will of God. It might not be because your idea was bad. It just might not be what God had planned for your life. And so you shouldn't get so down and heartbroken about what didn't work out. You should be seeking God and getting in relationship with him so he can guide you and put you on the pathway to where he's taking you. The Bible tells us to delight ourselves in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Meaning that if you delight yourself in the Lord, the more that you take pleasure in God and, and his will and his plans that he can establish in your heart your desires so that you can fulfill those and he won't let those return void. That he'll lead you and guide you and place you in a place where you find delight and you'll find pleasure in having fellowship with God. Well, well, you'll take time and you'll be happy to be in the presence of God. You'll be filled with joy to be in the presence of God. If you would just take a second and in the beginning of your day, start it off with prayer. Thanking God for how good he's been. Thanking God for waking you up one more time. Thanking God for the blessings that he's given you and your children and in your family and in your loved ones and in your job and all those things. If you would take a second at the beginning of the day and just delight yourself in the goodness of God, you'd be shocked at how it would change your attitude for that day. You would be completely baffled about how things that would normally bother you slide right off your back. When you delight yourself in the Lord, it changes the way you see things. That's why it's so important that we're not just focused on the way that he blesses us, but we focus on the relationship that he has to offer us. The problem that we run into a lot of times is that we feel that God should delight, our, delight himself in us, in our plans, and, and, and fulfill the way that we want things to take place when we say, how we say, and at the right quantity of what we say. But we have to understand that it isn't us that sets the pace. It's us following his instruction and listening to the way that he's guiding us and following, falling deeper in love with him in relationship. And it opens the doorway to the blessings that he has for us. If we think that we're wise enough and we're great enough to use God as a personal genie, I promise you, you will be severely disappointed. That it's not going to happen the way that you think it's going to happen. That you're going to make a request and you're going to tell God jump and he's going to say how high. I want you to understand that today so that you don't get bound to this thing thinking that, that God is going to follow everything you tell him to do. But the thing that we can do is begin to know him better in relationship. We'll know better of what his desires are. And as we love God more than we want those desires to be fulfilled and seen in the earth. We have to understand that the blessings are a byproduct of the relationship. The blessings are a byproduct of the relationship. And so it's not us getting in relationships just so that we can be blessed. We get in relationship and the blessings follow after it. We don't say, I need to be blessed, so let me get in a relationship with God. We say, I need a relationship with God, and as we do that, blessings follow. And if we get those steps in order, then it'll change the direction of our life. As we look at what they did with the ark, they brought it out to the battlefield and they looked at it more as a good luck charm than they did the presence of God. They thought, okay, if we, we took a loss, so let's bring the ark out and um, that'll help us 
get the power to win. Not the God behind the ark, the God who gave you the material to create the ark, gave you the experiences to create the ark. But let's just bring the ark out and they use it as a good luck charm. They, they really looked at the ark as an idol. So much so that they were more excited about the ark than they really were about the God who was supposed to be present at the ark. They saw the ark and instead of being reminded of God's power, they looked at it as an advantage to win this battle. This ark, instead of the presence of God, who he doesn't even need the ark to be there to show his power. But yet they looked at it as an idol saying, well, because we brought this out, God's going to have to give us a victory. He got to give us the victory because we got this out. He, he, we have to understand that it's not about these semblances of God. It's not, I came to church, so God's got to grant my prayer that I asked. I, I prayed once, so God has to do what I asked him to do. I, 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 I took time and I, and I read my word, so God, you got to do what I said that I want you to do. That's not the way that it works. So when they brought it out, and they, 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 they put it there and they said, now, God, you have to do it or else you'll look bad. <laughs> God, you got to grant my prayer or you're going to look bad. You got to win this battle for us. And it's going to make you look bad. Guess what? You're not God's personal PR person. Okay. He doesn't need you in order to let his name be great. He, he doesn't need you in order for his majesty and his glory to show. So when they brought it out, they were looking at it as an idol and used it the entire wrong way. Having, having a relationship with God because of who he is is so much more important than having a relationship with him because of what he does. He's holy. He's worthy. He's magnificent. And because he's given us the opportunity to be in relationship with him, we have to take a hold of that. I think about my, my relationship that I have with my wife and I speak to her regularly. I know her character. I know the things that, that she likes. I'm able to surprise her with gifts and do things like that because I know what she likes. And it would be foolish of me to only speak to her when I knew she was going to cook a meal for me. It, it would be foolish of me to only speak to her when I knew she was going to clean up the room for me. Okay. How bad would our relationship be if I only spoke to my wife if she was going to uh, do a service around the house and help out in things that were taking place. I would not make it very far in my marriage. My relationship would ultimately fail because I would only be focused on the benefits of having a full belly and a clean house. And instead of being in a relationship with my wife. Unfortunately, some of us have done the same with God. We say, God... Oh, uh, you know, I'm doing my own thing right now. We don't say it out loud, but we do our own thing until we need something. Then we go to God. God, you know, oh, I spent a little bit too much money this month. I'm going to need your help, you know, uh, making it through the end, making ends meet. God, help me out. I need you right now. And then we don't talk to him again until the, the 30th of the next month when money looking funny again. We, 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 we seek out to God because, oh, God, my relationship's on the rock. I need you. I need you now. And then when our relationship's going well, we don't spend no time in fellowship. We don't spend no time in prayer. We don't spend no time seeking after God. We have to get to a point where we don't seek God simply for the blessings. But we come to God and seek relationship, understanding that the blessings will follow. If you believe that, say amen. Amen, <coughs> amen. amen and amen. Finally, if we're going to get our battling basics together as we get ready for 2023, we have to put our praise in the right place. Put our worship in the right place. I told you when the ark came to the camp of the Israelites, they shouted so loud that the, the Philistines heard them and that they were afraid. That they were scared when the ark came in. The Bible says that they were so loud that the earth shook. They were cheering and excited about the ark coming in. They turned up so much because they thought this box, this chest, will be what gives us the victory. And as loud as they were, their problem was that they were praising the wrong thing. They were praising the presence of this box instead of praising the presence of a holy God who was with them. 
They were praising this chest, this ark, as an idol instead of worshiping the God who did all the miracles of all the things that were inside. Instead, their focus was on the wrong thing. And I have to be honest, sometimes we make the same mistake even in this day and age. How often do we come to church and have a great time and forget about the fact that we are here to have an encounter with God? We spend so much time fellowshipping and just marveling at being in the place and coming and hear the word being spoken that we forget that we're here to have an encounter with God. Not putting praise in the fact that we got a church building, but praising the fact that God is in the midst, that God is here with us. Not to get excited about a presentation, but get excited about the God who the presentation is about. That we don't get excited about the things around it. The music is nice and we can jam out. But the problem is you can jam out to any kind of music. You can jam out to any kind of, uh, uh, any kind of party that's taking place. But we don't just come to church to, to hear the music and hear the word. We're here to honor and worship God and have an encounter with him when we walk through those doors. So at the end of the day, the Israelites were loud, but all that noise didn't amount to anything. If I can encourage you, at the beginning of 2023, I don't want you to just be loud for the sake of being loud. I don't want you to raise your voice and, and, and yell just to say you raise your voice and yell. I want you, as you see God out this year, to really understand who you have in your midst. To really understand the relationship that's right there with you. Not praising the church, but praising God. By lifting up just a song, but lift up praise to your heavenly father who was worthy of it. They made all that noise and they still lost 30,000 soldiers in battle. They shook the ground and all that noise took place because it was for the Ark of the Covenant and not the covenant itself, the one who issued the covenant to them. Not the God who was enthroned in between the cherubim. And when they put all that excitement and all that noise into a representative and not directed to the author, it amounted to nothing. And so I'm telling you today, as you go forth in 2023, not to get to a point where you're just offering uh, 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 face value praise, that you're offering face value prayer, but instead you're truly seeking after God in the way that you worship, in the way that you spend your quiet time, in the way that you do anything, making sure that you're actually looking at the why and not just the presence of what seems to be what God is. So as we look at this, we have to understand that praise is still powerful, that God's presence is still powerful. We can look at, at other times in the, in the Bible, like King Jehoshaphat, when he went out and they worship and they praise the Lord, they won that battle. They were able to win that battle not because of what they did, but because God intervened on their behalf. And so praise still amounts to something positive when it's directed in the right place. When it was, they didn't praise the semblance of God. They praised the true and living God. And because they did that, the enemy was confused and turned on itself. And God won the battle on their behalf. Praise is still powerful, but we need to direct it in the right place. When our praise isn't towards God, then failure is bound to occur. And so after the battle was over, the Philistines just didn't kill 30,000 soldiers from the Israelites. They even took the Ark. They took the Ark of the Covenant. That's really what it had amounted to. It just amounted to a treasure chest at that point in time. Because the Israelites had lost the meaning of it. And Philistines, the true meaning of it was. And so it just became an article. It just became something that they took as a spoil of war. Today, I don't want your salvation. I don't want your experience with God. I don't want your prayer life, your worship, just to be something that is done just to do. 
But I really want you to know the meaning behind the worship you give, the words you speak, the prayers you give. I really want you to be at a point in your life where you say, despite the distractions and anything else and the battles that come my way, that the presence of God is what will carry me through. The Lord had already said that it was time for them to remove the idols from their lives. It was time for them to remove the things that weren't of him. And he even made clear that Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that they would meet their end for doing evil and putting the Lord's name in contempt. But he needed this to take place so that they understood it wasn't about a chest. It wasn't just about something that was a semblance of God, but they needed to focus their eyes on him. And so as we begin this year, whatever thing that you may have used as a distraction, whether it be church, whether it just be certain things in your life, Right now is your opportunity on day one of 2023 to focus your attention on God, to focus your attention back on the one who has the ability to give you the victory, to focus your attention on the one who will carry you through this year. You may not always get exactly what you desire and what you want, but I promise you that if you would just place your plans in the hands of God, That even though you make many plans, that you would understand that God's plan will be superior. If you face battles and trials, whatever comes at you this year, remember to stick to these basics so that God can lead you and guide you through this year. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you today for your goodness and mercy. I thank you for being our victory I thank you that we can rely and lean on you. We thank you that you're trustworthy. Lord, we thank you that you are constant and faithful. And and today, Lord, we pray that as we begin this year, that you would help us to get the basics down, Lord, that we would be ready for what comes, that we would be ready to face off any enemy that comes, God, that we would be ready because we've sought after you and because we're in relationship with you, we know that you will carry us through. Father, we're grateful and we're thankful and we give you praise. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. We just thank God for his word today and we're glad that you've made it here to 2023. We're wishing you a happy new year. Right now, we just want to remind you Uh, how good God is and all that he has set aside for you. Understand that God still has a plan and a purpose for your life. If there's any prayer requests that you may have, uh, we want you to, if you're watching this online, send it to us in our inbox. We want you to reach out to us. We'd love to pray with you and agree for you, whatever situation you have going on in your life. Also, if you live in the Greenville or the Hunt County area, we'd love to have you worship with us. We're here at 3710 Wellington Street right here in Greenville, Texas. We'd love to see your face in the place. There's also some ways you can get connected with us. What you'll see on the screen now is a phone number. We want you to dial that and connect with us, make you a part of our text group. We want to pray with you. We want to allow you to be aware of all the events that we have going on throughout this year. So please um, text that number and we'll add you to the Flow Fam. Finally, if you have been blessed by this in any way at all, we want to give you an opportunity to partner with us here. Um, We are uh, able to be um, partnered with um, by Cash App. You can uh, um, see the the address on the screen. It's Dollar Sign Rivers of Love Church. We'd love to partner with you in the ministry that we are doing right here and the things that are being accomplished right out of this body. I want to let you know that God loves you, and so do we. Happy 2023. God bless you.